Now, did I cover all hierarchical visual designs? No, I didn't. There are like lots and lots of hierarchical visualizations. I only covered a very small number because I would be here forever. And it's not really necessary to cover all of them. But in your, in your kind of travels through assignment one, you'll notice that there are other hierarchical visualizations out there that you can use. Right? There are probably 50 different kinds that you could create. So, in the next part, <laughs> we're going to look a little bit at graphs, very quickly at graphs. Anybody take the visual analytics? Class. Was there a lot of information about graphs there? Uh, anybody remember how many lectures about graphs there were? Were there like five maybe? Or did you skip the lectures? <laughs> I think there were about four, but they were all near the end of the module. Does that make a difference? It meant we started out with like projects before them. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about graphs just for half of a lecture on this. It's like a little summary. And then we're going to talk about visualizing n-dimensional data, which is arbitrary, arbitrary numbers of dimensions, which is what you have in assignment one. So this is a very, very short and convenient introduction to graphs. Graphs could be its own module, actually. It could be just a graphs module. And that's true about a lot of the topics we, we cover here. So this is an example of a graph. By the way, this is also an example of a graph. It happens to be a hierarchical graph. <coughs> So graphs are simply a set of nodes and edges that connect them. That's, that's what graphs are. And in the ideal world, all graphs and graph layout algorithms have the following goals, essentially. One is to optimize the length of the edges. So if the edges are too long, it's hard to make the connection visually between the nodes. If they're too short, then you might not even see that there are two nodes with a connection. So all graph layout algorithms are trying to optimize, get the perfect edge length. Another, another objective is to minimize edge crossings. So if you have graphs with lots of edge crossings, they're more difficult to, to see and to read it and to, to, to decipher. The perfect graph has no edge crossings. This is a perfect graph. It's not very big though. That's the, that's the thing. The more nodes you have, the bigger the graph it is, the more difficult it is to optimize the length of the edges and minimize the edge crossings. And then if edges do cross to maximize the edge crossing angles, what is the maximum angle two edges can cross? 90 degrees, that's right. So that's kind of here. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. I ask easy questions with the answers on the slides. 
So if two edges cross and they cross at a right angle, that's optimal if they, like, it's best not to have any crossings, but if they do cross, it's good if they cross at a right angle. Imagine two edges crossing at almost, like, parallel, then it's more difficult to, to read <coughs> and interpret. So the challenges with graphs are when we have very large graphs. If I ask you, if I give you a thousand nodes and I say, please construct a graph that has these three optimizations, it becomes very challenging. So large graphs are certainly a challenge. Time-dependent graphs are a challenge. How to update the layout over time or how to convey time inside of a graph. Hierarchical graphs are a challenge if they're very large. Label placement is a challenge if you're trying to actually label every node or every edge. And of course, trying to depict multivariate data on graphs is a challenge. In this example, the user has clicked on a node and then the edges to all the connecting nodes or related nodes are highlighted and the labels are highlighted as well. This is a graph probably most people have noticed or seen before. Has anybody not seen that graph before? This graph is actually quite, I find it very difficult, but you can see, well firstly this is not a necessarily like a, this is not a software-based layout. We're usually thinking about software-based layout, so an algorithm that you can write in software to automatically or at least semi-automatically lay out a graph. This is not, this was done manually. You can see that it has a lot of those properties that we just talked about. Whoever made this graph try to, for example, maximize the angles at which edges cross, or at least make them very nice angles. So you don't find intersections necessarily at 10 degrees or, or things like that. The lengths of the edges are, have gone undergone some sort of optimization, right? Whoever did it tried to keep the edges between the nodes kind of consistent. It's not perfect, but it's somewhat consistent. And and um, the edge lengths of the edge crossing, the edge lengths, and they also tried to minimize the number of edge crossings, which is not possible. Like you cannot completely avoid edge crossings, but whoever made this tried to reduce the number of edge crossings by as much as possible. I, I still get lost on the London Underground. I get lost on the northern line, right here, where the two northern line, uh, the, the northern lines meet and then they cross, and you don't, you can't be sure if you're getting on the right train going down here or down here. I always get those confused, and the uh, London Houston, I always get confused confused too, because it shows up as three or four nodes on the London Underground, but really it should be like one node. It's very confusing. But anyways, it's a very difficult job, right? Whoever did this spent many years on it, right? And it's undergone a number of versions. You can buy books on like the, the history of the London Underground map and stuff like that. Here is another view of London. It's a little bit different than the previous view. This is like a satellite view. Anybody know why I'm showing this? What's your name? Greg. Greg. That's the one difference, yes. Imagine we were, imagine I was in London, or imagine anybody was in London, maybe maybe you or somebody 
hopefully, well, it's better if, if it's somebody that doesn't know London like the back of their hand. But imagine you're in London and you're lost, which is easy, right? So you run up to random people and you say, I'm lost. <laughs> can you help me get unlost? Like, can you help me like, find out where I am or get somewhere? Yeah. You have two options. I have two printouts in my hand. I have this printout and I have this printout. Which one would you choose if you want to get unlost? find your place in London again. Anybody have an opinion on that? Uh, the one with the roads. The one with the roads? Like this one? So if I printed this out and gave it to you, you say, okay, now I'm not lost anymore? I mean, you, if the person knows where they are, like the person you're asking, they could probably point somewhere on the map. So okay. You can, you can you can just ask about the nearest station and where it is, and then you can go to your other map. There you go. So that that's if I was lost, I would hold, I would ask for this printout. I would say like, okay, uh, I have this map of the London Underground. What's the nearest stop? And then once you find your nearest stop, you can get to anywhere in London. You know how to get to anywhere in London. If I gave you this map, I don't know what would happen actually. You, you'd be wandering around. You might, you, you hope that you can find the streets properly. They're not labeled. But you kind of would hope that you could get unlost, but it would probably be more challenging. And you'd still be wondering, oh, what's the nearest station? Like, how do I find the nearest station? What is it? You'd still be wondering that. So why am I talking about that? It's just to, it's to make a point in that this is why the London underground map and graphs exists at all. This is like why they exist. So they take some aspect of reality. This is a one real aspect of London and then abstracts it for you and takes out some critical information so it's taking some critical information, the London undergrounds and the connections between them, showing that to you to get you unlost, and then leaving out all the other stuff, like the position of trees and buildings and all that stuff. And the point is that graphs are a very useful abstraction. And sometimes they're extremely useful. It's very nice to see in this case, if you're lost in London, it's nice to see a simplified version of London to help you get, like, found again. Yeah. And that's the reason why when you bring up Google Maps, you see the streets. Right? You don't get the satellite view by default. You get the street view by default because the street view is also uh, like a graph view of whichever city you're looking at or whatever town you're looking at. <laughs> By the way, th this is where we are in this map. <laughs> I don't know where that is though. <laughs> this is an automatic layout. The previous, algorithm, the previous map was a manual layout. This is an automatic <coughs> layout. And that means the nodes are positioned in space using some algorithm. And the edges are positioned in space using some algorithm. And the algorithm tries to do those things we mentioned, like optimize the length of edges, uh, optimize the angles at which they cross, and minimize the number of edge crossings. So it's a very tricky business, actually, to, to do those things, especially when you have large numbers of nodes. And again, the user has clicked on this node, which is computer science, and then linked universities. Uh, all the universities with computer science departments. So this is actually every, every um, 
these nodes represent the different subjects, and then these nodes represent the different universities that study the different subjects in Wales. Anybody ever seen this one before? Nobody saw this from their software engineering module? Did anybody do a software engineering module and then use Doxygen for their software comments? Anybody ever heard of Doxygen? <coughs> okay. This is another automatic uh, graph layout algorithm from do a tool called Doxygen, which is a tool you use to comment your source code and document your source code. In this case, all the nodes are classes and the edges are um, attributes of classes. Right, and the, and the edges also represent collaborations between classes. And Doxygen is amazing in the way it automatically generates these collaboration graphs. And the way they have minimized edge crossings is they've added curves to the edges so that the edges can go around things to try to minimize the crossings. It's a totally amazing tool, right? I, I'm amazed at how well that thing works. And hopefully you'll use it yourself one day when you're doing your software developments. Here's another example. Anybody ever like dabble with electrical engineering in the, in the room? Any electrical engineers? or computer and electrical engineering. You'll notice circuit boards follow these rules too, these graph layout nodes. Edge crossings are usually not allowed, right? And edge lengths are maximized, so electrical engineers spend a lot of time trying to maximize these or optimize these, these properties. So no edge crossings making sure that the edge, the angles are easy to, uh, to follow, right. Here's another example from flow visualization. You can actually generate graphs of flow. So these are critical points, like sinks in the flow, where the flow, um, you know, goes in, so to speak, or flows inwards. And then sources are where flow comes from, so to speak, like, like a faucet or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So sinks and sources, saddle points, where flow, it's not a sink or a source, but flow comes in tangentially and then exits tangentially. And this is a graph representation of the sinks, sources, and saddle points and flow. And you can see this is not an optimized graph. It, it's not optimized for edge crossings. There are too many edge crossings. It's not really optimized for edge length very much. And yeah, it's, it's difficult to see what's going on. This is what happens when you don't optimize your graphs in the, in the graph layouts. You get confusing graphs like that one. Okay, I guess we will stop there. Any questions? Good. Happy Monday evening.